Welcome to Exalt Church. My name is Roger. I'm the lead pastor here. And if it's your first time with us, we are thrilled to have you here. And if this is home, we're just as equally thrilled to have you here as well. We're going to continue the series, Renewing the Mind, Part 2. And so without further ado, let's jump right on into it. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, reading from the New International Version, it says, do not conform. That word in the original language, the Greek language, means do not, inten- do, do not imitate, do not adopt any longer the pattern of this world. But he says, but be transformed. The word there is metamorpho. The word, we get metamorphosis. And so the caterpillar turns into a butterfly completely transformed. It says, do not be transformed but, 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 but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And he says, then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good will, his pleasing will, his perfect will. And the will is the same will. There's not a good will of God and a perfect will of God. There is the will of God. And I don't got time to get into it, There is God's spoken will and God's hidden will. And he doesn't always show us what he's doing in his hidden will. But but that's a whole different message I don't have time to get into. But in this passage, you can't use this as a proof text to say that God has a good will, a perfect will, a pleasing will. I have a good wife. I have a smart wife. I have a beautiful wife. She's the same wife. Or I don't have three wives. If I do, I must be living in Utah right now, all right? I don't. I have a good wife, a beautiful wife, a smart wife. And so God's will is good, God's will is pleasing, and God's word is perfect. And and how do you know God's good and perfect and pleasing will? Here's how. When you don't allow this culture to mold you into its shape. And so basically it says, do not allow yourselves to be molded but let yourselves be transformed by God. Praise God for that. Amen. So last week we jumped into it. I gave you the first key of how to be renewed in your mind. And so how are we transformed? How are we changed? Is it God zapping us? No, it's being renewed in our mind. So I believe many of us want our lives to be changed. I believe many of us want to live a transformed life, a holy life, a godly life. I believe many of us here want to live a life that is countercultural. God did not save you to leave you like the culture. God did not set you apart to leave you stuck in your tradition, into, into, your, into your addictions and your sinfulness and your brokenness. God saved you to transform you. But how how we transform? It's by renewing the way we think. And so by renewing our stinking thinking is how we renew and change our lifestyles. It's renewing the faulty mentalities that help us to grow. And so last key we talked about last week was simply this. The new birth transforms my spirit, but my body and my mind remain unchanged. I talked about that for 45 minutes. I don't want to rehash that today. So if you want to go back, you can watch that on the website. It'll be up on the website, I believe, tomorrow morning at exaltchurch.com. You can check it out on YouTube, and also uh, also uh, you can check it out later on. So you can find that online. Key number two, we want to jump onto this, and this is key. We must apply the truth. And I want to pause here and say this. Um, there's a popular phraseology that we hear a lot of times. My truth. Your truth. Doesn't make sense. There is a real truth. There is, truth is an objective, is objective. And, and, and that may not be popular in our culture today, but there is real truth. Now, I understand that you may have your perspective And I may have my perspective, but it doesn't mean that both of our perspectives are truth. And so, if you're going to use that phrase, please, please use the phrase, my perspective is this. Your perspective is this. Please don't use my truth, because it's just, anyway. 
I love you. I'm being kind. All right. All right. James 1 and verse 22 puts it this way. He says, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. There's a danger today in our information technology world. We have so much information with us on our smartphones, on our televisions, on the radio. We, we, have, we have so much information coming and bombarding us. There is this temptation to believe that if I heard it, I am living it out. If I understand it, I'm doing it. And the reality is there are a lot of things I understand that I've heard, but I'm not applying. And, and here's the point I'm trying to get. We, we've got to apply the truth of the Scriptures. We, we've got to apply the truth of God's words because change is not automatic. Growing in faith and growing in holiness doesn't just happen by itself. In fact, the reality is oftentimes we grow out of holiness because we drift away from God if we're not actively applying the truth of God to our heart. My default, default position is to drift away from my faith, to just drift away from pursuing the things of God. Why? Because there's a part of my nature that doesn't want to submit to God's authority. And so change is automatic and application is essential. And so the renewing of the mind, the, the transformation and the renewing of the mind is more than just learning. You can have all kinds of facts and factoids and you can memorize the scripture and know the Bible. In fact, the Bible says that Satan knows the Bible and he believes. What? Does he believe to a saving faith? No, he believes God exists. And there's a lot of people, a lot of Christians that believe in God, that believe it's God's word, but they stop to, to apply it and they don't go the further step. And I would submit to you that we have enough information. We have enough information. We have an information explosion. We've heard enough sermons. I grew up in a tradition. We had Sunday school for an hour, Sunday morning service that went from 10 on a good Sunday. We got out at 1230 on a really good Sunday. It was 130. You know what I mean? The roast was dry. And then Tony and I had the same tradition. Then we came back at 6 o'clock and on a really good service, we got home at 10 o'clock at night. Because then at, 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 on Sunday night, it got really free. We wasted a lot of time is what we did. Amen. We'd, sung, we'd take one song and we'd sing that one song over and over and over again. And that wasn't enough. We'd come back Wednesday night and we'd have Bible study. We'd have prayer meeting. And then pastor decided we needed small groups, so we threw in small groups. And then some of us loved people enough that we went out into street ministry like Patrick Wallace. And so we did that one night. You've heard enough sermons. You've been to enough seminars. But yet I find this, especially in, in, in some Christian traditions, we want another revelation. Always seeking something new. And at Exalt Church, listen, we never want to be a place where we're just trying to learn something new, just trying to get a new revelation or some new intellectual insight. We, we, we want to be a place. We want to be a church that hears the Word of God in our values. We value God's Word. We believe the Bible is God's Word. We want to lift up God's Word, but we also want to go on and we want to apply God's word to our lives. So we want to be a church that hears the word of God, learns the word of God, values the word of God, but then applies the word of God that we already know. And maybe you're here and you're asking God for a word for your life and God is saying to you, I've already given you a word and you haven't obeyed the last word I gave you. So why would I tell you to do something else? How do I know that? I do that. We were praying about whether we should start a church. And, and I was praying and God wasn't talking to me. And Laura was saying, well, why, don't, why doesn't God talk to you? Why don't you listen a little better? I said, he, he's, he, he's not talking, babe. 
He would reveal to me where people's lost dogs were. He would show me people that were in adultery together in bed. I would see those visions. And I would see those kind of things. And he would say, she would say, what about a church? He hasn't said a word. I'm just going to obey what he told me. I mean, it's like watching a workout video on YouTube, Pilates, or my favorite guy, Chuck Norris, on the Total Gym. I like watching Chuck. That dude looks good. I can't figure out if he dyes his hair yet or not. I don't know if the Total Gym makes it look that good. I don't know. Maybe it help, helps the hair do too. I don't know. But you watch Chuck Norris and many has those guns and many looks good. And I'm going to eat potato chips while he does his commercial. Eating those Pringles and Chuck is working out and Chuck is looking good. And man, I'm getting fluffy. And so here's the reality. Oftentimes we, we, we want to, our, our favorite sport in America today isn't football. It's not baseball. It's not basketball. Our favorite sport is this, watching. A good friend of mine puts it this way. He was told me many times, and I agree with him. He said, the new smoking today is sitting, doing nothing. And so we can watch the sermon. We can watch the teaching. We can watch the good ones too. And men, they move us emotionally. Have you ever been to a revival meeting with T.D. Jakes? I got to hear him preach uh, in Los Angeles, California. And I stood with my unbelieving friend. And the entire balcony, I thought, was going to crumble and fall under the, the vibrations of people jumping and shouting. And I was moved. But if I did not apply what he preached... Laura and I got to be at the Vatican and see the Pope give a devotion. And that was amazing to be at the Vatican and be around these people and non-Catholics and watching people and watch him give a devotion. And what he taught that day was biblical, but if I didn't apply it, it wasn't going to help me. Are, are we applying the truth? Not to go through. We know not to go through the red light, Tommy. Amen. We, we know, but we need to apply what we know. But our minds tend to think if we heard it, we're doing it. Our, our minds tend to think that if we've watched it and heard it, we're living it out. And the reality is most of us have been discipled to a level far past our obedience. We've been educated past our last level of obedience. And I can watch the YouTube videos. It doesn't make me a mechanic because I don't apply what I watched. And he says, be transformed. He said, how? He says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so this complete change happens. This life transformation happens by the renewing of our mind. And how do we renew our mind? We hear the truth, but we also apply the truth. Now today, I'm going to spend some time on key number three. And here's my goal. I want to give you something to apply right today. And we're going to stop on this point. I don't think we're getting any further than this point today. Key number three is simply this. We must tear down established areas of wrong thinking in our minds, and the Bible often calls these strongholds. And so 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4 and verse 5 puts it this way. It says, For the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal, but they are mighty. That word there is powerful. Do not toss. Do not toss. It says it's powerful. So the weapons of our warfare, they're, they're not of this world. They're, they're not fleshly. They're not of the human construction, but they are powerful. They are divinely powerful 
through God, by God, on behalf of God. To do what? To pull down strongholds. To casting down imaginations. If you're taking notes, write down imaginations. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And he says, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That's the King Jim version. Look at the New Century version. Look at this. He says, we fight with weapons that are different from those the world uses. Our weapons have power from God that can destroy the enemy's strong places. Catch this. We capture every thought and make it give up and obey Jesus Christ. If you you get nothing else, please get this. Don't justify your ungodly thoughts. Tear them down. Don't justify your truth that contradicts the truth. Tear it down. Don't change your belief system when God zeroes in and God disagrees with you. Oh, I'm going to go there. Uh, In counseling, there's a phrase that we use. It's called cognitive dissonance. You've heard me mention it here before. Cognitive dissonance. Here is what it is. When you believe something or you have the values of something and you behave in a different way than what you value and what you believe, it creates cognitive dissonance in your mind. It creates stress. It creates pressure. And so because what I believe and what I value and what I hold to be true and what I'm acting out and what I'm doing are different, it creates this stress. And what we try to do, we try to relieve the stress. So so how do we relieve the stress when what I believe and what I value acts differently? So here's an example. You value your marriage, you value your wife, you're a Christian, you said, I will forever be married to her, but now you're having an affair on her and you're cheating on her. What happens? What you really value and what you really believe to be scripture and to be valuable and to be true is outside of your actions. So it it creates distress. It creates this pressure. It creates this disequilibrium where you're out of balance and and, and you're spinning. And so there's only one of two solutions. You have your belief and you make your actions come under and line up with what you believe and say, no, I believe the word of God. I value my marriage. I value my wife. Adultery, thou shalt not commit adultery. I believe it's a sin. It's, it's, it's outside. It's not who I am. It's out of bounds. And you relieve the stress because now you bring your behavior under what you believe and now you're in line and now you're not in this pressure. And so if you came to me, I would, and I'm a horrible counselor. You know what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to say, stop it. That's my answer for everything. I eat too much, Pastor. Stop it. I'm getting drunk. Stop it. I'm speeding. Stop it. I'm a racist. Stop it. You bring it under. Biblical. The other solution is to now hear your actions. And you change your values and your belief and you bring it under and make it subjective to your behaviors. And so some counselors to alleviate the pressure, some counselors to alleviate the pain, some counselors who believe that the ultimate goal of counseling is to make you happy. Oh, Lord, do I go here? Yes, I do. 
Dave, I, you know I love y'all. Can I tell you that? You know when I tell you that, I'm about to get you. You do know that, don't you? I love you so much. Bring out the paddle. All right. But in that, in that pressure to make you happy, I just want you to be happy, so I'm going to change your values. And so now you keep your behavior and you change your values, and now you keep going on, and because you don't believe that anymore, I can live this happy life. Cognitive dissonance. Either we're going to bring our actions under our values and our belief and make it submit, take it captive, and make it, make it come under and make it obey because the goal is not for me to be happy. The goal is to serve God and give honor and glory to God and serve Him with all of my life. And in the ultimate, I have joy and I am happy. But there's moments when I tell Roger, no, Roger is not happy. But is he full of joy? And is he going for a purpose? And is the ultimate reality fulfillment? You better believe it. Bring it under. Bring it under. Taking every thought captive. And that's where you tell your body no. And you tell your desires no. And you say, that is not for you. We have these conversations in our home where Lord and I look and say, we ought not watch that. You're right. We have spent money, walked into a movie, thought it was going to be violent. And that's why it was rated R. And we got in there. And listen, it wasn't violent. It was everything else. And we said, We can afford to lose the 30 bucks. We can't afford to compromise our souls. And we walk out. We got a good popcorn out of it. Yeah. Cognitive dissonance. What, what, What is a stronghold? A stronghold is simply this. If you're taking notes, write it down. A stronghold is when thoughts and attitudes have such a grip on your mind that even though you don't want to think the way you do, you do anyway. And and that word stronghold can be translated a fortress. And so it's a fortress that we've got to attack. It's a fortress that we've got to seize. It's It's a fortress that we've got to invade and tear it down. It can also be translated as a prison. And so it's when our thoughts and our attitudes imprison us. And so when we're consumed with negative thoughts and we're consumed with worldly ways of thinking, over a period of time, those pet things that we think we have a control of, that we think we can manage, that we think that we can stop at any moment, now controls us. And here's what's sad. Most of us are so self-deceived that even when we are controlled by it, we think we are still in control. And men, we're the most thick-headed about this. I'm a man. I can stop whenever I want to. Can you? And so strongholds are a prison. Strongholds are a fortress. And when Paul talks about, are you getting something from this this morning? You guys with me? Um, when you, when you um, are looking at this and Paul's talking about strongholds, I was studying this out uh, more this week, and it, it looks like Paul was referring, when he was talking about it, perhaps to Proverbs chapter 21. Is it 21 or 22? Let me look here. I, I believe it's 21. Yeah, 21 22, I, I wrote down in my notes. 21 22 puts it this way in Proverbs. Paul says these, uh, uh, or the, 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 the author of Proverbs says these words. He says, A wise man scales the city of the mighty and brings down the stronghold in which they trust. And so, Paul, it looks like Paul may be quoting the author of Proverbs when he says, We pull down the strongholds. 
We pull down these imaginations. Please bring the verse back up there, if you will. Back there for me. Bring it back up for me. From 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And so, I want you to see this when he brings it up. We're going to keep going on until he brings it up. Look at this. For the weapons of your warfare are, are not carnal, but they are mighty through God. The pulling down of strongholds. What's the next word? Casting down imaginations. And I, I want him to keep that up here for a moment because I want you to have that in your face for just a moment. Because my next question is this. Where are strongholds? Where are they at? Now, some of you were raised in traditions that thought strongholds were somewhere up in the sky and you went to conventions where you were taught to pray to rebuke the devil in the air. I knew a guy a few years ago, many few years ago, who bought an airplane in Dallas, Texas. You can't make this stuff up. Flew over Dallas, Texas, rebuking the demon of murder and pornography and rebuking the, mur the demon of rebellion and crime. He raised money for it. His partners gave him money to do it. Crime went up. It didn't go down. Here's the point. Christians, we're always looking for the easy way out instead of really dealing with what God is saying. Because it's easier for me to rent an airplane, buy an airplane, and fly around and rebuke imaginary demons over Dallas than to deal with real strongholds in my life. But pastor, there's real demons. Yes, there are. There's a real Satan. Yes, there is, and you've never met him because you and I aren't important enough. If you do, i got a counsel I'll refer you to if you think you're important enough to meet Satan. His demons get assigned to me at times, absolutely. And do we rebuke them? Absolutely. Some think, well, this means exorcism. No. Have I performed exorcisms? I have performed a handful of exorcisms, and I won't glorify you with all, glorify him with all of the crazy details that happened in that. Do I believe in Satan and his demons? Yes. Is he a real entity? Yes. Is there operations? Yes. Do people become demonized? Absolutely. Have I seen things that would make a good Hollywood movie? Yeah. But we get obsessed with, I'm going to fly, I'm going to rebuke the devil up here. I'm going to rebuke Satan right here. Another one is this, and I'm hitting this because I want you free. And if I'm using humor and sarcasm, I'm using it because I want you to remember it so you laugh about it, so you remember what I'm talking about. I'm trying to be mean. Others get caught up in this stuff called generational curses. Oh, it's because my grandpa did it and my great-grandpa did it and it's just an unspiritual gene passed down. All of us have that gene. We got it in Adam. It's called the sinful nature. We all have the sinful nature. So here's the point. Strongholds and spiritual warfare happens in the location between your ears. He says the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal, but they are divinely powerful by God to pulling down prisons and towers and fortresses, casting down imaginations and everything Every thought that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. Cognitive dissonance. This is the word of God. This is my thought. This is my reflection. This is what I'm thinking about. This is, this is what I am wanting to do. And you capture that thought and you bring it under obedience. Bring up the next translation up there, the NCV, I believe. Look at this. 
We fight with weapons that are different from those the world uses. Manipulation. Hate. Put in here whatever it is. Nuclear bombs. Our weapons have power from God that can destroy the enemy's strong places. We capture every thought and make it give up and obey Jesus Christ. I like how it says it that way. So if you're struggling in a certain area, one of the things I would tell you to do is, even, yes, in this in this great technology time is get a three by five note card write down the bible verse and memorize the bible verse until you know it and when that temptation comes you proclaim the word of god to it when satan came and attacked jesus christ and tempted him what did jesus christ say he said it is written Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. If you have a problem with pride, is it written, man shall not think of himself highly than he ought, but to think with sober judgment. And what do you do? You arrest that thought and you say, this is who I am called to be. And the culture is trying to pressure me and move me back under over here. But I refuse. You see my hand? I refuse by the culture to be pressed and pushed and molded back under this thing. No! No! I grab that thought. And it struggles and it wrestles and it fights. And says, you will bow the knee to Jesus Christ. Now, I, I, and I got the baby crying. I got some of the adults crying here. I know. It's my spiritual gift. Babies cry. Adults cry. I, I, I want you to hear this. Because this, this, this bringing into captivity. Th- there are some of you here, and I've heard your testimonies, that when you were addicted to alcohols and drugs, when you were saved, bam, it was completely gone. There's others of you, you've had to go to sobriety and walk through the 12 steps and you fought through it and you struggled through it. There are some of you that when Jesus Christ saved you, you got zapped and a lot of things went away, but you weren't made perfect because I've hung out with you. I know your flaws. You may not cuss or chew or date girls that do, but I know other stuff about you. And you know other stuff about me. If you don't know, ask my wife, ask my mother, ask my father-in-law. Mother-in-law will tell you how good I am. Father-in-law will tell you the truth. We must do the hard work. And when he talks about bringing this into captivity, I I want you to understand something here. The grammar of the original text seems to me, as I read it, study it, to point to a continually struggling warfare. It is written, flee fornication. Flee sex outside of marriage. You don't do that one time and it's gone. Why? Because you were made a sexual being. And you're going to have to struggle and fight and bring that thing up. It's going to be a continual struggle until you are resurrected and you have a spiritual body, meaning your body is directed and animated by the Spirit of God and that old sinful nature is gone. And you're going to struggle and you're going to wrestle and you're going to bring it under and say, nope, I'm not going to give you a place. I will say this. I think I want to give you some hope. As you continue to bring that under, it gets easier. Like when you're running, what happens? That first week you start running, man, you're hating life. You want to go back and watch Chuck Norris. You know, you don't want to be running. But as you begin to run, you build up a tolerance, you build up a strength. But the moment you think you've overcome it, beware, because that's the moment in your pride. Beware lest you stumble. Bring it under. It's a struggle. 
going to wrap it up here with this last couple thoughts. I'm one of three boys. My sister died before I ever knew her, so there was the, the, two, the, the three of us boys, and we were all boys. We were hyper. I'm the shyest of my brothers. Am I exaggerating? Wow, D, uh, D says. Say it backwards. Wow, I am the shyest of my brothers. Laura once asked my mom, how did you raise three boys like your boys? My mom said, true answer, she goes, I smoked a lot. <laughs> we would wrestle. Remember wrestling? We would wrestle. We would, and you know, you don't do it on the couch, but guess what three boys do when mom walks out of the room? We're on the couch. Have you seen the Clepper boys? Love those boys, and they're good. Well, watch them wrestle. When they were younger, they wrestled a whole lot more than they do now. I think dad jumps in there sometimes too. We'd wrestle, but here's what we would do. Brother would pin me on the ground, and I would be on the ground. And you know how the rule is. Both shoulders, Laura Siegel, have to touch the ground. Not one, both. You can be suffocating, but as long as one shoulder is up, the match isn't over. And so my brother would have me on the ground. I can't breathe. I am sweating. I am miserable. I, and he'll start going, one, two. And I would, I would summon the power of Hulk Hogan or Bulldog Bob Brown, and I would pop the one shoulder up. And he goes, I won. Uh-uh, this shoulder's not down. And what would he do? He would push that shoulder down and my other shoulder would pop up. One. No. No, you can't count to three. My shoulder's up. Here's the point. You may be struggling. You may be wrestling. Hold the weight that's on you is on you. But you know what happens? You are struggling and that shoulder keeps popping up. And you just keep popping that thing up and you just keep wrestling and you keep fighting. You keep saying, you're not going to beat me. Say yes to that. Amen. I want to give you hope that although there was a struggle and though there was a fight and though it was a wrestle, are you struggling in your marriage? I am thrilled that you are struggling in your marriage because it means you have not been beat yet. No, my shoulder is still up. You may have counted to two, but ha ha. Oh, wow. Did I just say ha-ha in a sermon? I guess I did. Someone hit the mute button here somewhere. I, I, I want to end. Oh, I, don't even, I, don't, I didn't even tell you how to do it. Oh, Lord. Come back next week. I'm going to give you five steps to how to do it. I'm telling you to do it. Next week, I'll tell you how to do it. You guys, you guys are having me preach too good this morning. Or... Strongholds in prayer. Listen to me. Listen carefully. Hear what I'm saying, not what I'm not saying. Prayer alone will not renew your mind. You've got to start changing the way you think. Of course, pray about it. Of course, spend time with God because as you spend time with God, you're going to get closer to him and you're going to draw power from him and you're going to draw energy from him and your character is going to change. Absolutely. But just praying that God will deliver you from it isn't enough. You've got to start applying the truth. Is that what I'm saying? So let me clean up my mess. Do I sometimes rebuke demons? Yes. Do I sometimes renounce some of the things I have seen in my parents and I don't want that in my life? And back to Adam, yes. 
Do I pray that God would change my character and change my heart and give me a compassion and mercy? Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Do I rent an airplane and fly over Chesapeake? No, 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 no. But the way you're going to change, the way you're going to be transformed, you're going to dig into the Word, you're going to find the verses that apply to your situation, and you're going to begin in your life to begin to grab those thoughts one by one. And you're going to seize it. And through the scriptures, you're going to begin to renew your mind in the way you think. It was the church that taught me through the scripture how to handle money and how to view debt. It was the church that taught me about my body belonging to God. When we got married, I grabbed my dad and pulled him aside and said, Lord, I would really appreciate it if you'd have the talk with me, Dad, because you never had the talk with me. And we had a good laugh about that, but Dad never did. Why? He just didn't do that in his generation. You get into the Scripture. And you start seeing it, and you start seeing a countercultural mind and a countercultural way of thinking. Forgiving your neighbor, forgiving the one that hurts you, blessing those who curse you is countercultural that this culture will not teach you. But you learn that through the scripture, and you seize the thought in the mind. And you arrest it. Loving your neighbor as you want to be loved. That is countercultural. Loving your enemy. That's countercultural. Loving those who you think are out to do you in is countercultural. How do you learn that? You don't learn that through this culture. It's telling you to hate. You bring those thoughts into captivity. I don't vow to 100%, nor will you but I want to live a life that brings God glory and honors Him. Amen. I want to renew the mind and be transformed. Why don't you stand with me, if you will. Praise God. You still love your pastor? Look at me. I'm going to look at you. We have the lights on so I can see you. I can't always see you. I can see you today. I love you so very much that I'm giving my life for you. I love you so very much, I'd rather be here than any other place. I love you so much that even when it's difficult, I will tell you the truth when it's hard. But never doubt my love for you, never doubt my best interest for you. But more than that, you have a father who is my father that loves you infinitely, uh, infinitely, more than I love you, who knows every detail of your life and he can't get enough of you and he pursues you. And he says, I'm still excited about you and I'm not done with you. Amen. And he says to you, I love you so much. That I'm not trying to be your killjoy. I'm not trying to beat you up, not take pleasure in rebuking you. But I don't want this world to destroy you. But I want you to be all that God is, that I have called you to be, is what he says. You're my child, he says. And I want people to see me in you. Amen. So if you doubt the intention today, and if you doubt the bluntness, it's this. You have a father that loves you so much that he will speak the plain truth to you. Amen. And hear this. He is not done with you, and he will never be done with you. Amen, amen, amen. Tommy, come and try to top that, brother.
So anyway, here's here's the reality. There's someone in your life. There's someone at your job. There's someone in your family, someone in your neighborhood that doesn't know their love. They don't know their character. Tell them that you love them, and they don't know that God loves them. Tell them that. Invite them to Exalt Church. Invite them back next week. Invite them for this series. Please bring them back. And thank you guys so much for joining us. If you came in this morning and you were prepared to give, that's phenomenal. We're not sitting around the basket. But there is a kiosk in the hall. If you've got cash or a check, drop that in there. You can also go to exaltchurch.com. Go to the drop-down tab where you found the Connect card. You know, I talked about it at the beginning of service. Click on that Connect on that drop-down tab. Go to the bottom. You'll see the giving tab. Click on it. You can give automatically. You just put in the amount and the frequency. You can give via text. We've made this very easy. You can also give uh, via mail. All our mailing information is online as well. Regardless of how you give, thank you for partnering with Exalt Church. Thank you for your gifts. And um, we thank you for joining us. Have a great week. God loves you. God bless.